Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So let's cut the pages. The beginning of summer break every year is my cue to get started on the mountain of books collected over the past months. Fantasy, nonfiction, science fiction, all genres can be found in these piles. These past two summers, however, my stack of books looks slightly different. Composed almost entirely of books recommended to me by my mother and my English teachers, the first thing that stood out to me were the page edges. They were reminiscent of older books whose pages would have to be cut in order to be read. The edges of my books were similarly rough and uneven. I sifted through and found novels ranging from The Great Gatsby to The Lord of the Flies to The Picture of Dorian Gray to Anna Karenina and more. These were the classics. Mark Twain famously said that a classic is something that everybody wants to have read and nobody wants to read. I did not feel this way. I was intrigued by these books. Most of them are over a century old, yet they are perhaps equally as popular as the trending new releases on the front shelves at bookstores. So I jumped right in. And as I went through each story, I was surprised to discover some common threads. How could books published between 1811 and 1954, at least the ones in my particular stack, a span of 143 years, both remain relevant to modern times and contain so many similarities and overlaps with each other? Why do the classics still grace our bedside tables and find their way to spots on our bookshelves? My encounters with the dignified and capable Ellen O'Hara, independent and humble Constantin Levin, bold and intelligent Elizabeth Bennet, and every other character in these books made me realize that all of them, with their flaws and virtues, come together in their undeniable humanity. It is the complexity of this humanity and the rich and powerful writing that conveys this complexity as well as the simplicity of human need that explains why the classics have stood the test of time and have not been lost in the chaos of modern information. This idea of a common human experience as seen through the classics, can be broken down into three different parts. Connection, acceptance, and aspiration. It starts with connection. I remember my excitement to meet new people and make new friends on all occasions since I was little. I even remember going up to people I didn't know to introduce myself running over to people I did know, and even excitedly greeting people whom I knew, but who did not remember me, which I'm sure was a slightly mystifying experience for them. In looking at something as simple as meeting new people, shaking someone's hand, we see a universal experience of forming connections with others. Not only do the classics teach us the importance of such encounters, but they help us understand how to approach them. They show us the value of reserving prior judgments and remind us that, as F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote, whenever we feel like criticizing someone, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that we might have had. The classics encourage us to embrace the opportunity to get to know others and hear their story and their experience. And who knows, we might learn something new. However, the classics do not regale us with this advice. Rather, their dignity comes from only showing us the tip of the iceberg and letting us form our own ideas about the rest by forcing us to ponder and allowing us to connect with the characters and their stories. 
by welcoming us into the hearts and minds of the characters, we connect with them and we learn more about them through their stories and through their actions, whether of kindness, greed, or generosity. The emotions felt while reading the classics can be similar or equivalent to forming connections with others. They give us a better understanding of others and consequently can give us a better understanding of ourselves. Connections with others or these riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart also teach us acceptance, not only of circumstances, but also of people and who they are, because people, unless given specific impulse, do not tend to change. A thief is a thief first, and your friend second. Sometimes moving towards this acceptance is not easy. In Gone with the Wind, Rhett accepted and supported Scarlet's ambition and ruthlessness, but he eventually could not accept the fact that she was not in love with him and he removed himself from her. Scarlet, alas, realized her love for him too late. Nevertheless, this resolution remains important, whether accepting positive or negative aspects of people or of situations, like Nick's acceptance of Gatsby, even though he scorned everything Gatsby represented in The Great Gatsby. All of these characters shifted from having certain unrealistic expectations to accepting both people and situations. And they learned to be at peace with this acceptance. Following this acceptance, I observed that all of the characters seemed to possess a desire for something better, something beyond what has already been attained and what is already known. These are our dreams and are looking to see if there isn't something left in life of charm and grace. The characters in Anton Chekhov's short story, The Beauties, long for that missing piece that will give them satisfaction. Anna Karenina longs for a profound romance beyond her marriage, and Janie, in Their Eyes Were Watching God, is searching for the freedom to live a life of her choice. The characters were motivated by their dreams, and their dreams gave them something to work towards and pushed them to persist in their endeavors. Each of them took their own path towards their personal goals, but in the end, what comes into relief through the odyssey of each character is the rich texture of every human being constructed out of pieces of strength, beauty, ugliness, and frailty. We are surrounded by examples of the perfect happy ending, one being old Disney movies, where every character never fails to find their perfect happily ever after. In contrast, the classics have enlightening endings. We can hope for the perfect happy ending, but it does not always happen and we end up boats against the current. The classics teach us to look for a sense of contentment and resolution instead of this idealized happy ending. And these can manifest themselves in different ways. It might be a great joy of work, such as Constantin Levin and Anna Karenina found. Thinking of nothing, wishing for nothing but to do our work as well as possible. Or it might be a sense of inner peace and not letting others destroy that, as Jane Austen said in Sense and Sensibility. For me, these are the most elegant discoveries of human character. One thing everyone has to do for themselves. They have to find out about living. But the classics can illuminate that path. As Oscar Wilde said in The Picture of Dorian Gray, the aim of life is self-development. To realize one's nature perfectly, that is what each of us is here for. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They have forgotten the highest of all duties, 
the duty that one owes to oneself. The classics have survived for decades, some for centuries, amidst the chaos of changing times and new information. I encourage you to explore them, or if you have already, to find unexplored ones. It's time to cut the pages. I invite you to pick one up, whether today or perhaps tomorrow. After all, as the great Scarlett O'Hara said, tomorrow is another day. Thank you.